cowboy leads a different kind of life when there were cowboys. They're a dying breed. Still means something to me, though. A couple of days, we'll move this herd across the river, driving through the valley. Oh, <laughs> there's nothing like bringing in a herd. See, now that's great. Your life makes sense to you. <laughs> My wife basically told me she doesn't want me around. Is she ready? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just saying. Uh, how old are you? 38. 39. Yeah. You all come off here about the same age, same problems. You spend about 50 weeks a year getting knots in your rope, and then, and then you think two weeks up here will time for you. None of you get it. Do you know what the secret of life is? No, what? This. Your finger? One thing. Just one thing. That's great, but what's the one thing? That's what you've got to figure out. Do you want to know the secret of life? Yeah, sure. That's what the cowboy in City Slickers 2, Jack Palance, asks. Cowboy asks the city slicker, and the city slicker says, yeah, of course, what's the secret of life? Your finger? He says, no, one thing. The natural question, Billy Crystal says, what's the one thing? And the cowboy says, that's what you have to figure out. One thing? We are a generation of proud multitaskers. We can't only be doing one thing. We're wasting time. Forget about walking and chewing gum at the same time. While we are running, we have to listen to a podcast or take a course. We have to, while we are at a meeting, check our email. While we're driving, we have to answer texts. Please don't answer texts. I've seen people online or people on TV who can juggle Rubik's cubes and solve them as they are juggling them. It's amazing what human beings can do. Many things at once. We think that it's a good thing to do more than one thing at a time. We admire and praise people who can do two or three things at one time. The multitaskers, we think if we are doing more than one thing at a time, we're being more effective. If we're more effective, we'll be more successful. And if we're more successful, we'll be more happy. But what we need is not happiness. A funny thing happens to us on the way to our busy, multitasking, fulfilled lives. And it's stress, getting all tied up like a rope in knots. And there's no joy there. Is it possible that this chain-smoking cowboy latched on to a secret in the Bible to joy in life, the joy of the single mind? Is it important? Is it true? Is it biblical? Is it possible that this cowboy can give us a hint about the source of joy in life, one thing. Maybe today you are all stressed up with nowhere to go. Maybe for you, you're doing too many things at once and you need to focus on one thing. Maybe you are frazzled in life. And so what you need to do is stop multitasking and find your one thing. Wholeheartedly pour yourself into something more important. Last week we began a study in Philippians, which I'm calling Choose Joy, Joy Even in the Mess, with a study about being together. We are made for community, and up front I have this chain made all out of one block of wood, and that is us linked together, and we are all in community, or we should be, we were made for community. Last week we learned First, that joy is a choice. We choose joy. It's not something that we get. 
It's something that we learn. It's something that we choose. And so it is not the absence of problems. It is the presence of Jesus. It doesn't come from what goes on around me. It goes, comes from what goes on inside of me. I'm in charge of my own attitude. I'm in charge of my own joy. We can choose joy by choosing community and being together. But this week we want to turn in the next passage, beginning in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, to the joy of the single mind, as Paul tells us about many things. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things, plural, which happened to me, bad things, all bad things, have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. The bad things include getting arrested for preaching the gospel, being thrown in prison for being shipwrecked. Some bad things have happened to him, but it's turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains, notice he writes this letter from prison. This is a man who's learned the secret of joy in the mess, even in prison. My chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, other Christians, having become more confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. How does he have joy in the mess, even in prison? Because he has gained perspective. And so he says these things <clears throat> have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Have you ever noticed how hard it is most of the time? to see God's hand in our life when we're going through troubles. Then we think God has left us. God, where are you? But after a trial is over, isn't it so much easier in 2020 hindsight to see, oh, God, you were with me the whole time. Wow, this actually turned out for my benefit. I actually learned something. You see, this is where we get meaning in life. Joy is not found in more it's actually found in less. So he says here, I see, I see. When my flight was canceled, all of a sudden I missed this, but I had an opportunity for this. When I was empty, I learned to trust you. When I was suffering, my faith was deepened. Lord, when I saw only one pair of footsteps in the sand, that was when you carried me. It actually brought out the furtherance of the gospel because in prison, he was chained to a guard, a Roman guard. And so he had a literal captive audience. He said, this is good. So verse 15, some Christians, some preachers, indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife. When I was a young idealistic seminary student, I couldn't imagine how in the world any preacher could preach from bad motives. I thought, that's ridiculous. And then I got into the ministry, and I realized that I was an imperfect preacher, and sometimes my motives weren't exactly pure. And then I saw some preachers on TV who were obviously in it just for the money, and I realized, yes, there are some out there who preach for envy and strife. Impure motives? Yeah, sure. But some preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, make it worse for me but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then, he says, only, this thing only, that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, no matter how they preach the gospel, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, there's the key word, 19 times in Philippians. In jail, he writes, join the mess. <clears throat> in this I rejoice and I will rejoice. Notice there, I choose to rejoice. I may be in prison, but nobody is in charge of my joy except for me. I choose my attitude, and I, do, I choose joy. So the first big idea in our passage today is that joy is not found in more. We want more. If we just had more money, if we just had more time, if we just had more friends, if we just had more space, we think we'd be happy, but actually we're learning that it's not found in more, but in less. We need to find our one thing. He says, what then? Only that in every way, 
whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this one thing, I rejoice and will rejoice. Only that. Notice Paul has a one-tracked mind. Sometimes my wife accuses me of having a one-tracked mind. And I usually take that as a compliment. Now, if it's because I'm talking about baseball, that's probably the wrong track. But if my one track is Jesus, people, well, that's the right track. His one thing is that Christ is preached. He says, so I'm in prison? Big deal. I can preach to some Roman guards. I'm right here in Rome, the middle of the world. Sick? Well, I can still have joy because... I can have joy when I'm sick, when I'm betrayed, when I'm broken. He says, in this, I will rejoice. Here is the secret of choosing joy in less, in one thing. You see, joy comes from meaning. He says, the things that happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Paul chose to look for and assign meaning to the circumstances of his life. Stuff happens to all of us, good stuff and bad stuff. Things happen to him. That's what goes on outside of us. We're not in control of that. But turned out, ultimately, God used it. And so what he sees is meaning. There's meaning in my suffering. Is there meaning in your life? If there's meaning in your life, if your life is not just some random events that take place one after the other, trivial pursuits, if you're just in to survive, there is no meaning and there can be no joy. But if you learn to put what happens to you in perspective, you can have joy in the mess. You see, what is most important is not what happens to me, but what's most important is what I tell myself that it means. If someone calls me a loser, does that change who I am? No. But if I say that means I'm a loser, it changes who I am. It actually makes me into a loser. Not what they said, but what I tell myself it means. So I lose. I lose a game. I lose a promotion. Does that make me a worse person? No. If someone hurts my feelings, that's not what's important. It's what I tell myself it means. So my healing doesn't come. Does that mean that God doesn't hear me? No, it's what I tell myself it means. Not that God doesn't care, but if I tell myself it means that it's not God's will, then I can still have joy. So here's the question. What does what's happening to you in your life mean? What do you tell yourself that it means? This kind of self-talk, if you talk to yourself, people might think you're crazy. But if you talk to yourself and you tell yourself, that doesn't mean that God doesn't love me. That doesn't mean that I'm not valuable. That doesn't mean that God doesn't care. It's what we say it means that really changes our life. So Paul takes the chance to, while he's in prison, tell someone about Jesus. So meaning comes actually from purpose in life. Joy comes from meaning, but meaning comes from purpose. You have to have a purpose in life. What is your purpose? If there's no purpose in life, if there's no creator, there can't be purpose. If there is no purpose, there can be no meaning. And so we need to get our purpose from the one who made us. Why did God make us? He says his purpose is that Christ is preached. Here's his one thing. Nothing else mattered to Paul. With Paul, you might have heard me say before, It is not a good question to ask when bad things happen, why? That's the first question we ask, right? Something happens. We say, why? Why did I get sick? Why did I lose a loved one? Why? Many times there's not an answer, at least in this life. The better question to ask is what? What should I do, Lord? Well, in circumstances, yes, it's important not to ask why, but to ask what. But when it comes to choices, We need to ask both what and why. Yes, in this case, when we make a choice, we need to say, why am I choosing that? What should I do? And why am I choosing it? So here, why is a good answer. What is my purpose? What did I do? Why did I do it? That's important. Animals don't need a purpose. 
but we are people creating the image of God and we can only be joyful if we have a purpose so we can have meaning in life. But purpose brings us priorities. That's the third step in this little chain here. Meaning brings purpose and purpose brings us priorities. And so these priorities tell us what are important and what's not important. Remember we started the service from Luke chapter 10. Jesus saw two sisters, Mary and Martha. You all know Martha, that type A person who's always busy and she's worried and troubled about many things, Jesus says. But Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, just soaking him up. And he says, one thing is needed and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Mary was only concerned about one thing. And that one thing was Jesus. Martha was concerned about many things. She wanted to multitask. She wanted to listen to Jesus while she was washing the dishes and putting away everything. Jesus said, Mary, relax, chill. It's okay. You can do that later. Right now, Mary has chosen the most important thing. Does that mean you never do the dishes? No, of course not. We get priorities when we recognize that we have a purpose. Do you remember, are you old enough to remember 911? All of a sudden, America was one nation. We weren't liberal or conservative, Republican, Democrat, black, white. We were all Americans and united for about two weeks. We had new priorities because we saw how important it was. If you want joy in life, it is not found in more, ask Martha. Not more money, not more time, more accomplishments. Actually, it's found in less. The lighter the load, the greater the joy. If you are backpacking and you try to take it all with you, you're not going to backpack very long and you're not going to enjoy it at all. The less you take on your, on your hike, the more joy you will have. The same thing is true in life. My wife, learned, and my wife and I learned this a couple months ago when we moved yet again. We thought, boy, we wish we had a lighter load to move. All this stuff, do we need all this stuff? Jesus says one thing is necessary. And so the cowboy raises up his finger and says, you want to know the secret of life? Yeah, sure, everyone does. This is it, one thing. And the city slicker, Billy Crystal, says, what is that? That's what we want to discover. What is the one thing? What should our one thing be? Philippians chapter 1 and verse 19. This is what Jesus says next in the passage. I, or Paul says, this I know, that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I know this will turn out. You know what that is? Paul has learned to trust God. I don't know what's going on. I'm in prison. I didn't do anything wrong. I preached Jesus. And you'd think Jesus would want me out there on the streets preaching, but no, he has me here in jail preaching. Okay, I can trust him. I know this will turn out. In verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether in jail or free, whether by life or by death. Wow, he has got a single mind. He says, all I want is for people to see Jesus in me. We have two different tools to see things that we can't ordinarily see. We have a telescope to see things that are far away. We have a microscope to see things that are small. Jesus isn't small and he's not far away, but people can't see him. But you and I are to be microscopes or telescopes for people to see Jesus. And he says, I can do that even in the mess. Maybe especially in the mess. When do people notice the difference in us? When we don't sorrow as others who have no hope. When we have faith even in the trials. So he says, verse 21, here's the key to the whole passage. The key to the whole book. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Is Paul suicidal? No. He doesn't want to die. Suicide is selfish. It's short-sighted. It's rebellious to God. He does say in verse 22, 
For if I live on in the flesh, great, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two. I have stress between two things instead of one thing. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So I'm going to let God decide. I'm not going to say, Lord, take me home now. Or I'm not going to say, Lord, let me live. I'm going to say, Lord, whatever you want. Not my will, but thine be done. Verse 25 And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress, and here's the key word, and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Whatever happens to me, I want God to use me, life or death. I want God to do something in me. I don't care what happens to me. I care what happens in me and through me. I've got one track mind, he says. I care, I I find joy in my one thing. And here is the second big idea, the second secret found in this great passage. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You see, joy is not found in nothing, but in something, one thing, the right one thing. I'm not saying minimalism, give away everything you have and be poor and homeless yourself. No, focus on one thing. It's not nothing, it's something. It's better someone choosing the one thing. So here is the key, choosing the right one thing. You remember the answer, what's the one thing? That's what you've got to figure out. I want you to give the pastor a finger this morning, this one right here. Everyone put up one finger, one thing. What is your one thing? Think for a moment, with your finger still up. I want you to fill in this blank. For me to live is, you can put anything you want in that blank. You can put money in that blank, a bigger home. You can put more fame, more fun, a greater high, more conquests. But what you put in that first blank determines what the second blank will be. If for you to live is Christ, for you to die is gain. To be with Christ, to be away from all sin and sorrow and loss and pain. If Christ is in the first blank, the second blank is cake. But if you take anything else and put it in that blank... How about uh, for me to live is getting money? That's what a lot of people, that's the American dream right now, is if I can just get money, if I can get some more stuff, then I'll be happy, maybe have joy. But if that's what you put in the first blank, what goes in the second blank? Leaving it all behind. We know it, you can't take it with us, but inevitably, You want to spend the rest of your life trying to be the richest person in the graveyard? You can't take it with you. So what is to die if it's getting money? In 1 John, it says there are three things that are in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the eyes is what I can have, and that's money. Second thing, the lust of the flesh is what I can do. And if you put in that second blank what many people put in there, having a good time, let's live it up. You only go around once in life. Yeah, but if you have a great time every minute of every day, the rest of your life, what is to die? Having it all end, taken away. It says the things that are in the world are the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That really capsulizes everything the world has to offer us. That is pride, position. And so if what I want is to be famous, to be known, to be loved, to be admired, if it's all about pride, then what does to die mean? That means to be forgotten. You mean you spent all of your life struggling for your 15 minutes of fame, and what does that get you in eternity? What is your one big thing? You get to choose the first. And if you choose the first, 
then the second blank fills itself in. What is your one big thing? Make sure that it's big enough to fill your life and bring you eternal joy. Paul says, for me to live is Christ, therefore to die is gain. Now I need you to pull out your finger again, make sure you get the right one. And I want you to see with me what David says. David in Psalm 27, 4 says, one thing I have desired of the Lord. One thing. Where's your fingers? Come on. Where's your finger? One thing I have desired. What is it? That I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. He says, one thing I want. Put your finger up and say, one thing I want. If you want two things, you'll never be happy. If you want one thing, you can have joy. He says, one thing I want, and that is the Lord. John chapter 9, verse 25. I want to talk about this man who was born blind. Remember, Jesus touched him and he was healed. And they came to him and they asked him, who was this guy? I don't know who he was, but he said in John 9, 25, pull out your finger, one thing I know. Say that with me. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Has Jesus changed your life? Someone you might want to share the gospel with someone, you don't feel qualified to be a missionary or an evangelist. Can you say one thing I know, Jesus changed my life? and he can change yours? You may not be able to answer all the theological questions. You may not be able to put together an excellent presentation of the gospel, the theology behind the substitutionary atonement. But can you say what this man born blind said? One thing I know. In Philippians chapter 3, later on in Philippians 3, Paul says, the man in prison says, one thing I do. Pull out your finger again. Okay, hold up. Here we go. One thing I do. One thing I want, one thing I know, one thing I do. And it's all one thing. It's Jesus. One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Remember Jesus said in Luke 10, 42, One thing is needed. One thing is needed. One thing I want. One thing I know. One thing I do. Do you want to know the secret of life? Just look at your finger. One thing. What is that one thing? Ask yourself, what is my one thing? Is it what God wants? You ever tried to listen to two people at one time? Sometimes I'm speaking to a husband and a wife and they both want to talk and neither wants to stop. And you just kind of have to choose. One of, you can't listen to both at one time, right? James chapter 1, verse 8. The double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Try and hit two goals. Try to shoot for two targets. You'll miss both of them. But if you can choose one thing and make it the right thing. Some people choose one thing and they choose the wrong thing. But if you want to know the secret of joy, don't take it from Jack Palance. Take it from the Apostle Paul. One thing I do, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Passionately leading people to surrender to Christ. Give your undivided attention, the focus of your life, to wholeheartedly pursuing one thing. Paul has got it figured out. It's the furtherance of the gospel, that Christ is preached, that Christ is magnified. To live as Christ. Jack Palin says, that's what you've got to figure out. Paul says, I've got it figured out. Here it is. Forget multitasking. Let's try this week unitasking. One thing. Yes, I have to eat. Yes, I have to sleep. Yes, I have to go to work. I have to go to school. I have to do this. I have to take out the garbage but it's all about Jesus. How can I magnify Christ? How can Christ be seen in my life this week, in my good times and in my bad times? One thing. Can you do one thing? 
Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for this guidance from a man writing from a prison cell who chose joy. And Lord, I pray that you would help us, your children, none of us in prison. Lord, help us to choose joy this week, today, right now. Help us to know that one thing is necessary. Help us to want one thing. Help us to know one thing. Help us to do one thing this week. And Lord, may it be the right thing, a big thing, the only eternal thing out there. Lord, help us to serve you, to love you, and to serve you by serving others this week. Lord, if there's one here today who's never trusted in Christ as their Savior, I pray that today they might do that one thing that is necessary. Stop trusting in themselves and their good works and turn to you, the one who has died for our sins. Thank you, Lord, for doing what we couldn't do for ourselves. Lord, I pray that you'd help that one person who doesn't know you to surrender right now to you in faith and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself, but I believe you died on the cross for me. And I ask you to forgive my sins and make me your child. With your head's still bad. If you prayed that prayer this morning, I would love to pray for you. Would you allow me to do that? You can check off on that attendance sheet found at the end of your pew. Yes, I gave my heart to Christ for the first time today, and I meant it. If you didn't and you need to, would you settle it today? Stop me on the way out today. Say, Pastor, I'd, I'd love to know for sure Christ is my Savior. If you're a Christian today, is God speaking to you about that one thing? Lord, help us to not be so scatterbrained. Lord, forgive us for multitasking ourselves into trivial lives. Lord, help us to focus on what's really important. Help us to be like Mary. Help us to focus on you. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing a great invitation hymn. Only trust him. Only trust him. The one thing. Ron, come and lead us.